So now you know about complex Morley wavelet convolution, you know about the filter Hilbert method, and you know about the short time FFT method. The question is, when should you use each of these methods for doing time frequency analyses? How do they compare with each other? And is that even a useful question to ask? So you can already guess that the answer to that final question is no, it doesn't really matter, but we have to talk about it anyway. So let us start by comparing wavelet convolution and filter Hilbert. So what you see in this plot are a wavelet in the time domain, so a, a, the, the real part of a Morley wavelet, and the filter kernel from an FIR uh, bandpass filter. And you can see that they are not identical, but they are really similar. And I've already discussed this a few videos ago when I introduced you to the FIR filter kernel construction procedure. So they are quite similar to each other. Now let's look at the amplitude spectra, so the frequency representation of the filter, kernel, and the wavelet. So here's the wavelet in gray, and of course you know that this is the wavelet even without this legend because the shape of the power spectrum of the Morley wavelet in the frequency domain is always a Gaussian. And here we have the filter kernel. So you can see, again, they are not exact, the, the same in the frequency domain, but they are quite similar. So here's some points of comparison. So the filter Hilbert method involves more parameters as I discussed in the video on filter Hilbert method. So we had, let me see if I can remember, there is the kernel construction algorithm, there is the uh, order, so the number of taps, the number of time points in the uh, kernel, there is the uh, transition zone for how gently these slopes go down to zero gain. And then there is the bandwidth, which is the width of this plateau up here. Wavelets, on the other hand, have only two parameters, one of which is the frequency of the sine wave that determines the peak of the, uh, of the, the wavelet, the peak frequency of the wavelet. So that's even, you know, not really much of a parameter. The key parameter for wavelets, of course, is the width of the Gaussian, which you can define either as the number of cycles or as the full width at half maximum. So there's fewer parameters. That has two implications. One, it means that it's easier to do the analysis using wavelet convolution. It's a bit more tricky here. There's more to think about. And it also means that there are fewer opportunities for failures or accidental failures here. It's actually surprisingly easy in MATLAB or in any language you're using, any programming language, to create a bad filter that uh, doesn't do nice things to your data, that's going to screw up your data and give you terrible, uninterpretable results. So that's easier to do with narrowband filtering. It's harder to screw up, basically, with wavelet convolution. So these are kind of idiot proof. Wavelet convolution is also faster because you're just doing a couple of FFTs. It's one FFT of the data, one FFT per frequency, per wavelet frequency, and one inverse FFT per wavelet frequency. The filter Hilbert method is slower, in part because the filtering takes longer, and in part because the Hilbert transform itself involves several FFTs, so, uh, so this computation time is longer. The main difference and the main reason, the main circumstance where you might want to prefer filter Hilbert over wavelet convolution is the feature of wavelet convolution, of Morley wavelets, that they are always Gaussians in the frequency domain. You have no control over the shape of the uh, wavelet in the frequency domain. It's always a Gaussian. In contrast with FIR filtering and also IIR filtering, but more so with FIR filters, you have control over the shape of the spectrum. So let me give you uh, one situation, an example situation where that might be useful. Let's say you have an a priori hypothesis about gamma, wideband gamma, so let's say 40 to 80 hertz. If you were using the filter Hilbert method, you would only need one filter that spanned 40 to 80 hertz, and then you apply the Hilbert transform and you extract the uh, power time series. If you are using Morley wavelets, it's not possible to get one wavelet to span from 40 to 80 hertz. So instead, what you would do is create a series of wavelets that 
you know, maybe let's say 15 or 20 wavelets that go that peak from 40 hertz up to 80 hertz. So then you would have 20 different wavelets with slightly different frequencies. You would extract, so run convolution for each uh, wavelet separately, extract the power time series, and then average those power time series together. Now, not that that's like some huge ordeal that takes three days to compute, but it is, you know, running a little bit more analyses than you need compared to the filter Hilbert method where it's just one single filter. You can also see in this plot an example of where filter Hilbert might be more advantageous. So you can see that we can create this filter to have much more frequency precision. So this is really isolating. This the filter here is really isolating this band from, you know, wh whatever this is, 12 to 30 hertz or something. Whereas the wavelet is underrepresenting energy here and overrepresenting energy here. Now, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing depends, of course, on the goals of your analysis, but you can certainly imagine a situation where you would actually want to have maximal energy within a specific range and minimal energy outside that range. And if that is your goal, then you are you might be better off with the filter Hilbert method than with wavelet convolution. So for these reasons, I generally prefer wavelet convolution in particular for, well, obviously these are the two advantages over filter Hilbert. And there are definitely situations, in my case, in my hands, uh, the kind of analyses that I do, it's much more rare that I will prefer filter Hilbert, but this is just something to keep in mind. Okay, so now let me compare Morley wavelet convolution with short time Fourier transform. And unfortunately, I don't really see any advantages for the short time Fourier transform. There are more parameters to worry about. The computation time is slower. I mean, it's still all based on the FFT, which itself is fast. But here with the short time Fourier transform, to build up a time frequency plot like this, depending on the parameters that you use, you might be running hundreds or thousands of FFTs, and each individual FFT is fast, but when you add them all up, you know, you're doing many, many FFTs, it ends up taking a long time to do the computation, whereas wavelet convolution is the least number of FFTs that you can get away with. With wavelet convolution, you retain the temporal resolution of the data, and that's because convolution retains the temporal resolution of the data. With the short time Fourier transform, you typically have a lower temporal resolution, and that's because this time window here for each individual FFT gets moved along by, let's say, 100 milliseconds or maybe even 200 milliseconds. So the temporal resolution here can be the same as the original data, but then it means you're really doing a ton of FFTs. So in practice, the temporal resolution ends up quite a bit lower. So you might be wondering why people use the short time Fourier transform instead of wavelet convolution, when wavelet convolution can give the same results, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and it's faster and more computationally efficient and also has advantages. The main reason is that the short time Fourier transform was around before it was developed before wavelets were developed, before the whole theory of wavelets was even discovered. So short time Fourier transform is, you know, it's, when it's used, it's, it's mainly used for historical reasons because it was the dominant method for time frequency analysis a few decades ago. And, you know, some people just continue to implement the same procedures because that's what they are comfortable with and that's what works. So to be clear, there's nothing wrong with the short time Fourier transform. It's a great method, it's fine, but it's hard for me to imagine any specific advantages of the short time Fourier transform over wavelet convolution. I've never come across any. Okay, but do these three methods actually differ? And the answer is no, they don't. In earlier iterations of this course, I would give people an exercise, I would give students an exercise where they would take some data, either real data or simulated data, and they would have to produce a time frequency power plot from Morley wavelet convolution, filter Hilbert, and short time Fourier transform. And you will see they discovered that given you know appropriate parameter selections, 
the results are nearly the same. You get almost exactly the same results from time from these three different time frequency analysis methods. So that's easy to demonstrate to yourself. And if you want, I encourage you to do this as an exercise. I actually stopped giving this exercise out in teaching mainly because it turned out to be not so interesting and it takes quite a while to write all the code for doing these three different analysis methods. I think it's better to spend that time doing more uh, kind of practical hands-on work that leads to more important applications. Anyway, several people have investigated more rigorously whether these methods are the same or different, whether they give different or the same results. This is one of those papers. There are several other papers. So the idea of this paper was to analyze the same data using these three different methods that you now know about. Short time Fourier transform, filter Hilbert, and Morley, complex Morley wavelet convolution. So here you see some example results from this paper. Here is the uh, raw data signal. And here you see power time courses from Fourier, trans uh, so yeah, short time Fourier, filter Hilbert, and wavelet convolution. Now, these are not exactly identical, these three different time series here, but you can see that they are really, really, really similar. Now, of course, they're not identical. Anytime you change the analysis, you're going to get some difference in the result. The question isn't whether these overlap perfectly. The question is whether you would arrive at different conclusions, whether you would say different things about the data based on the results of these three different methods. And in these cases, these are with uh, three different frequencies, the answer is clearly no. Now, you might wonder how much this is dependent on the analysis parameters that you pick. And the answer is that they are, that, so the, the comparability of the results from these different methods is a little bit dependent on the analysis uh, parameters. So here, for example, you see the bandwidth. So this is the trade-off between temporal precision and spectral precision. And what you're looking at here is the parameters on the x and y axes, and the color here, the grayscale intensity, is the correlation coefficient. So this is for comparing short time FFT and filter Hilbert, and you see that you know when the parameters are selected to be comparable, the correlation between the results from these two methods is basically one you know, a little bit less than one, but really, really high. And even all the way out here where the parameters differ quite a bit, the correlations are still around 0.9. So we still get really strong correlations. So this is short time Fourier transform and filter Hilbert, short time Fourier transform and wavelet convolution and filter Hilbert and wavelet convolution. I think you're getting to see the point, which is that it doesn't really matter which method you use, as long as you are using these methods appropriately you are going to get basically the same results to within some reasonable degree of tolerance.